It's a great honor and a privilege to have this opportunity. Georgetown University is a very well-known university in Spain, the country I'm coming from, because our king, King Felipe, studied here, international relations, so everybody knows about Georgetown University. And I have here some uh, good friends who are part of your faculty. It's about uh, 50 months, something more than four years, that I've been serving as a uh, high representative of the European Union for foreign and security policy. During this uh, time, during these uh, four years, multiple crises have been spilling out. It's a violent river that is uh, overflowing its bank. And I will not uh, make a long list of all crises because I'm sure you are studying them. Let me uh, focus on what is today the major challenge for the Europeans, which is uh, the Russia aggression against Ukraine. And through this war, we Europeans, we have rediscovered the world the way it is. We have rediscovered the harshness of the world. And we have discovered also that we were not prepared to face such a situation, such challenge. And we were not prepared because uh, we built a project, the European Union, which was built exactly in opposition to the very idea of power politics. And then when the, the war came and we discovered the harshness of the world, we were not prepared for that because we have been trying to eradicate from our instinct, the instinct of war, that has been causing so, so much trouble over years, over centuries, because we Europeans, we had to spend centuries at war. First, uh, the war of religion for centuries. Then, uh, in the name of nation, the empires, the will to power, Europe has been the continent with the highest number of interstate wars. But after the last one, after the World War II, the idea of uh, European unity began to emerge with the priority of stopping making war among us, to put an end to the war. The wars that have been ravaging the continent, and by the way, bringing the American boys to participate in these wars, was something that we wanted to forget and overcome forever. This was the starting point of our idea of integration. And we try to do it through economy, believing that negotiating and engaging and open borders and trading will diffuse conflicts and make war impossible. And it has been a great success. Certainly, an historical success. 80 years of peace among us. Today, the idea of war between European Union member states is unimaginable. Germans and French students cannot imagine that they could be sent to a tranche to kill their, their friend of Erasmus last year. It is something that is, has been taken out of our collective imagination, and that's a extraordinary historical success. But the downside for the Europeans is that we began thinking that uh, if we make peace among us, war was equally disappearing on the rest of the world. Pax European meant uh, universal peace. Well, this was a big mistake because conflicts persisted everywhere. Maybe they didn't concern us directly, we were not involved on them, but uh, our conventional wisdom was peace is the natural state of things, which is completely wrong. Well, it worked during the Cold War, 
because by definition the Cold War remained cold. And in fact, European security was uh, uh, ensured by an external actor, by the US. And many people in Europe were saying, well, we build peace, if you want to talk about war, please call to the US. Because the US were guaranteeing our security to NATO. Then the Cold War finished, and we believe in a world without war, and this was something that we could uh, perceive. Where the war? If there is no war, why should I have a stock of ammunition? I better increase uh, social security expenditure. We believe that this history has reached an end, and we expected the triumph of democracy. Russia became a member of the G8, and China joined the WTO. So the two authoritarian countries, the people who were our enemies or adversaries during the Cold War, they became part of the institutional setting, the G8, the WTO, and we were told that uh, globalization made borders meaningless and geography also not relevant. It was the end of geography. But uh, what do we see today? We see two violent conflicts in the world, very violent, one in Ukraine and the other in the Middle East, and which is at stake? Geography. What matters? Land. These are the old wars for land. People who are fighting for a land that they believe is their land. Russia claimed the Donbas and the whole of Ukraine is part of Russia. And in the Middle East, two people are fighting because they believe this land belongs to both of them. Again, territoriality is at stake. In Ukraine, we are facing a conflict between a sovereign, independent state, Ukraine, and Russia, an imperial power, or more than imperial power, an imperialistic power, that is still has a colonial vision of its identity. Uh, well, it has been like this for years, for centuries, first with the Tsars, second with the Soviets, and now with Putin. For Putin, as long as Ukraine was uh, on their orbit, they could accept formally the principle of an independent Ukraine. Independent, but not as much. Part of their sphere of influence. But when he realized that, in fact, Ukraine was uh, leaving this sphere of influence and breaking away from Russia influence, and gravitating towards the, the West, towards Europe, he started destabilizing the country. And we know the different stages of this destabilization process. Annexation of Crimea and the occupation of Donbass. In fact, the war in Ukraine didn't start two years ago. It started in 2014. Since then, it has been a war in the Donbass. Before the war started in, uh, in uh, February, two years ago, I was in the Donbass, and in the Donbass was a real front line that has been costing thousands of lives to the Ukrainians. When the Putin perceived that he was unable to destabilize the country, he opted for an open war. Uh, open conventional war with thousands of tanks and hundreds of thousands of soldiers with the idea of waging a quick war, a decisive campaign that could uh, just last a week. He expected victory in a matter of days, and it failed. I was in the Ukrainian parliament, and eight kilometers from the Ukrainian parliament, the Russian tanks were there. And I seen the lines of Russian tanks destroyed 
just eight kilometers from the Ukrainian parliament. He could have taken Kiev, but the Ukrainians resisted. And then the war came. And then we had to decide what to do. And I remember a conversation with the Prime Minister of Ukraine one week before the war started. And he was asking me, are you going to help us? We know that your people, your young people, will not come to die for Kiev. But are you going to provide us with the arms that we need in order to resist? And the answer has been yes. Europe has reacted in a remarkable manner that was neither guaranteed and not expected by Russia. Russia believed that we were not going to resist and to support Ukraine resisting. That a strong dependency on Russian gas would make us unable to support Ukraine. And uh, Europe was too much divided in order to be able to provide arms to a country at war. But the contrary happened. We supported Ukraine. We adopted packages of sanctions against the Russian economy. We has been freezing all the assets of the Russian Central Bank in Europe. We stopped our energy imports from Russia. We were dependent by 40% of our gas imports from Russia. We canceled it, something unthinkable. We have uh, capped the price of Russian oil, thanks to the fact that we have a kind of monopoly as uh, insurances of maritime freight. This is an in instrument of the European power, which is not very well known, that make us possible to put a cap on the price of uh, Russian oil. And we took the historic decision of making Ukraine becoming a member of the European Union. This will be a different Ukraine. This will be a different European Union. If Ukraine is becoming a member, it will fundamentally change the European Union. And for good, because we need to ensure our eastern borders. We provide a massive economic and financial support to Ukraine. We receive 10 million Ukrainian refugees, 10 million people. It's easy to say, but uh, to receive and accommodate 10 million people without creating any trouble is something remarkable. And we have been supporting Ukraine with more than 120 billion euros. By the way, more than the U.S. has done not from the military side, where you have been stronger than us, but uh, adding up all the elements of the support, economic, military, financial, humanitarian, refugees. Our support to Ukraine has been the most important in the world. Our military support has been important also, about 28 billion, but certainly less than the U.S. But we are the stronger the biggest supporter, financially speaking, of Ukraine. And thanks to that, and thanks to the U.S. support, Ukraine has been able to continue fighting. And Russia has suffered a colossal strategic defeat. As I said, they were at the gates of Kiev, eight kilometers from the core of the political system. But they suffered an enormous setback and Ukraine liberated about half of the territory that Russia has been captured, unblocked the Black Sea routes, allowed them to continue exporting wheat to the rest of the world. And today the Russian economy are facing bleaker, bleaker prospects, as the recent figures show. But I have to be uh, candid and I want to be frank with you, Russia has not yet lost the war and has not changed its strategic calculations. And now we are entering a new and delicate phase of this conflict. And I think it's important, and allow me to use this opportunity to discuss with you, it's important to fully understand the magnitude of the situation to assess the difficulties that we and the Ukrainians are facing today 
A new bombing in Odessa has made a lot of uh, civilian casualties in the streets of this beautiful city. And try to imagine how we can adapt to this new phase of the war. So, what is this new phase? First, we have to recognize that the Russian regime has regained political space. Putin has done that in a number of ways. He has consolidated his power internally. That's clear. The demise of the, well, the demise and the killing of the Wagner leader, Prigozhin, and the murder of Alexei Navalny sent a clear signal that uh, there is not opposition at all permitted in Russia. They are going to do elections one of those days. But you can imagine what elections means in Russia, where if you dare to go to the street and say something against the war, you will be in jail for 15 years. But Putin is in control. On the other hand, he has been able to move towards a war economy, converting the civil industry into a military one. This is the authoritarian regime, and it has a formidable network to evade sanctions, particularly through Central Asia. And then came the Hamas attack on the 7th of October, the terrorist attack of Hamas, and this has amplified the political space for Russia. The Hamas attack has resulted in this uh, Israel offensive. This has shifted the center of gravity of global attention. And many countries um, on what we call today the global south, which were supporting Ukraine, but uh, with a certain ambiguity, yes, they support Ukraine because it's very bad to invade the neighbor and uh, the nation's charter, uh, territorial integrity, okay, that's good. But they were not as much enthusiastic as we were uh, on facing Russia. And now, and now they point to us with the accusation of double standards when we see this, the, the dimension of what's happening in Gaza, I call it a carnage with more than 30,000 people, civilian people, most of them killed, and the failure of the international community to step in and to stop it. The call for respect of international law has become much more difficult for us when the international community fails to stop the biggest humanitarian catastrophe of our time. But it's not a humanitarian catastrophe created by nature. It's not a earthquake, not a flood. It's a man-made catastrophe. I was in the Security Council two days ago in New York, and I told the members of the Security Council that if we really want to stop this war, and to look for an stable peace and security for Israel, for Palestine, and for the whole region, the Security Council has to define the parameters of a process that can only be imaginable if we agree on the two-state solution. But this is another issue. What happens, certainly, is that Russia has taken political advantage of this situation and increasing the support from many countries of the Global South. If tomorrow it was going to be another vote in the General Assembly of the United Nations, the result would not be as solid as it has been supporting Ukraine. On the other hand, this war is uh, asymmetrical. Why I'm saying asymmetrical? Because Russia simply needs not to lose in order to win. Not to lose is enough for Russia. For Ukraine, it's different. Ukraine needs to win in order not to lose. And this is the fundamental difference between winning uh, and losing. 
And because uh, additionally for Putin, Russians' lives are cheap. He has many. And he has sending troops to the front line without taking a lot of consideration about the amount of human losses. But Ukraine has not the means nor the desire to sacrifice a large number of its soldiers and its population. Small country with comparison with Russia. They don't have the manpower capacity that Russia has. And they value differently human lives. And the war is increasing uh, intensity and becoming more lethal. The disparity between the two societies is growing. And I'm afraid to say, but it is uh, shifting on Russia's favor. Moscow has adapted and strengthening its defensive position, supported by Iran and North Korea, with a certain advantage in terms of ammunition, manpower, drones, and electronic warfare. For Russia, what matters is to infringe to Ukraine losses which are proportionally much greater than uh, the one that Russia is suffering. Well, this is in accordance with the known principles of the war of attrition. And what's going on is a war of attrition. And Russia believes that time is running on his side. So to call for negotiations today is uh, pointless unless what you want is to accept the Ukrainian surrender. But if you don't want Ukraine to surrender, don't expect any kind of negotiation possibility coming from Putin. He is waiting. He thinks that uh, time runs in his favor. He knows that there are American elections. He knows that there are European elections in the springtime. And in this context, the important thing for us Europeans is to call for Ukraine to continue resisting. And I think this should also be the call from the American side. Because there are lessons from the history that we should not forget. Appeasement, isolationism, appeasement. Oh, maybe if we give uh, to this bloody dictator what he wants, maybe he will calm down. Well, maybe we can isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. Remember 39, 1939, when the French people were saying, why should I die for dancing? Dancing, the Polish border, where the Second World War started. Why to die for dancing? And here in the U.S. in 1940, when the war was already raging in Europe, here and Washington Mall, just some minutes from here, many people were protesting against any kind of U.S. involvement on the Europeans' war, the Second World War, another war among Europeans. But war came anyway. Uh, and here in Europe we have to ask ourselves, are we living a Chamberlain moment, appeasement, or are we living a Churchill moment, Resistance. Resistance in front of someone who is really a threat for us. This is the same question that we could uh, ask ourselves in Europe and here in the United States. Because the question is not uh, if we have to die for the Donbass. The question is not if the Europeans or the U.S. have to go to Donbass to die for the freedom of Ukraine. The issue is, are we ready to provide the assistance that the Ukrainians need in order to stop dying for Donbass? Them to stop dying for Donbass? This is the question. And I think that the history gives us lessons. Russia was allowed to attack Ukraine because he believed that we were not going to react. And he believed that we were not going to react because we didn't react it when Russia took Crimea. And Russia attacked Syria 
also when he considered that the West was not going to answer. So we have to have a unified view, a strategic view about Russia. And today in Europe, the vast majority of people conceive Russia as a direct threat to our security. This is a sentiment which comes from Lisbon to Riga. Well, things are not the same. If you live in Portugal, in the Atlantic, or you live in the Baltic, nearby the Russian border. But more and more people understand, and the French president was saying yesterday that very clearly, that uh, we cannot afford Russia to win this war because we will no be longer in security. And the possibility of a conventional high-intensity war in our borders cannot be ruled out. And we are working on this scenario. And this has several consequences. First, we have to urgently be looking for more ammunition, more than we can produce anywhere around the world. You have some spare ammunition, please tell me, because I'm ready to buy it and to send it to Ukraine. We have identified 800,000 ammunition of 155 caliber, NATO caliber, in several factories around the world in order to be sent to Ukraine. We have increased our production capacity by 50% in one year, which is remarkable, but it's still not enough because the Russian artillery shots four times more than the Ukrainian can answer. We have to increase, and you have to increase, the defense capacity of our industry. You know which is the biggest problem to produce arms in Europe? We don't have powder. Powder? Yes, we don't have powder. Why? Because the main product to produce powder is cotton. I didn't know that. Maybe you didn't either. Cotton. And we don't produce cotton. As much as we don't produce paracetamol. When the pandemic came, we discovered that in Europe, we didn't produce a single gram of paracetamol. Everything was produced outside. And now the war comes and we discover that we don't produce powder because we don't produce cotton. And who is selling us powder? China. China, the biggest supplier of uh, powder to our defense industry. Well, this is not uh, something to be very sure. So we should increase our defense capacity, the quality of our military equipment. It has been quite exceptional in the past years, but we have to develop more our technologies and we have to overcome the hesitations in order to increase our support to Ukraine. At the beginning of the war, we were offering the Ukrainians helmets. Oh, you're going to be attacked. Don't worry, I'm going to send you 5,000 helmets. Now we are offering them F-16. And between helmets and F-16s, it has been a long way. But this long way has been uh, run through too many hesitations. Abrams tanks, Leopard tanks, Patriots, uh, shadows, now the discussion is about long-range missiles, the Taurus, but we have been able to provide what Ukraine needed. Maybe we should have done it quicker. We have to do it quicker from now on. And nobody can do more than you. If by a decision of the U.S. Uh, government or parliament the U.S. was not willing or not willing or not being able to provide more military support to Ukraine, certainly we could not take your place. We can increase our support, but we cannot substitute the U.S. on this uh, endeavor. The second consequences is that uh, we should, uh, we Europeans, increase our strategic responsibility. We have been too much depending on the NATO and U.S. umbrella. I am not saying that we can go out of NATO and we look for an alternative to NATO, and certainly it is not, but we have to increase our capacity. Our capacity which will require sacrifices 
and demand collective action. Everybody agrees it has to be done, but it is easier said than done. We have to integrate in our mindset the idea that uh, Russia is an enormous threat to our, our security. And this is uh, why Germany and France, for example, which are at the heart of the Union, are trying to give uh, concrete answers. From the German side, this answer has been captured by a single word, Seidwende, which means a turning point in history. That's why Chancellor Scholz told to the, uh, to, the, to the German parliament. We are living a turning point in history, he said, in the immediate aftermath of the war. And this turning point came with a 100 billion investment package into the German army. For the Germans to spend more in arms is something that goes against its recent history. But they are doing that. And much of this arms is being spent buying U.S. arms, indicating the Germans' conviction that in the medium term, the European security without the U.S. is just unimaginable. But France, on the other hand, has concluded that Europe must stand on its own feet in matters of defense as soon as possible. There are different approaches, of course, this is a schematic picture. Poland and the Baltics both want, want both, both things. They want a strong domestic arms, a strong industrial capacity, a stronger military capacity, and to be backed by the U.S. And then they have some members of my union, which has a long tradition of neutrality, that is also being changing because the two most important neutral countries, Sweden and Finland, who remain neutral, uh, now they are members of NATO. So Putin has just got the contrary of what he wanted. He was complaining that he was encircled by NATO, and the result is that there are more NATO members on their borders. I am strongly convinced that uh, Europe's strategic responsibility must to be developed inside NATO, where the European pillar should be developed, but also from our side. And allow me to say that I understand that the U.S. may have uh, other strategic priorities outside Europe. In fact, before the war started in Ukraine, the U.S. was withdrawing from the European scenario and looking at the Indo-Pacific area. And China was the big issue. Now the U.S. has been obliged to go back to the European scenario because the war is, is there, unexpected, but now it's there. And I understand that uh, the U.S. has other strategic priorities. In fact, any state has always their own strategic agenda. But when I appeal to the commitment of the U.S., it is not appealing to your generosity. It's just to remind us and to you that the United States themselves has a fundamental interest in ensuring that European security could be guaranteed and the stability of Europe is strengthened and prosperity not being threatened. Why? Well, first, because Europe is by far the most important partner of the U.S. And second, because if the United States were to disengage from Europe, the credibility of the alliances of the U.S. with the rest of the world would be undermined. Your credibility would be at stake. And I want to remind you again that uh, Russia intervened in Syria because they saw that we remain idle in front of the Crimea invasion. So I did that in Crimea. Nobody has moved. Now I go for Syria. And Russia intervened in Ukraine later because Russia saw the U.S. disengaging from Afghanistan, a disengagement that... Uh, the U.S. Uh, 
was sure it was going to happen, but not so quickly. I was talking with the U.S. strategic persons, and they understood that, well, maybe Afghanistan will be lose, lost, but in a couple of years. Well, it happened in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks, in a completely unexpected manner. And then Russia said, well, if they disengage from Afghanistan, maybe I could do something in, in Ukraine, because these people look quite weak. You don't have to look weak in front of someone like Putin. By the contrary, you have to show a strength. We Europeans and, and U.S., we are deeply intertwined. Our interests are deeply intertwined. And we should do more together in order to prevent uh, Ukraine losing this war. This war has changed us dramatically. We are not looking at the world on the same eyes. Now we understand that war is not the natural state of things, that war is in our borders, that millions of people escape this war, and we have to host them. And now we are on alert because our vital interests are at stake. But the awakening of Europe should not imply that the U.S. should rest easy. I think that we both have to remain vigilant because our strength comes from our unity. We have been working together for decades in order to ensure freedom, prosperity in the world. And this is the time to continue doing so. That's why we are looking so closely to the decision that has to be taken here in Washington by the lawmakers. And that's why um, our call for the U.S. public opinion is don't believe that Ukraine is something that happens very far away and it doesn't matter for you. What's happening there will decide the security of the Europeans and also the security of the Americans. Thank you.